Hello and welcome to the first and possibly last edition of Face the Atlantic. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and my guest is John Dickerson, uh, Atlantic contributing writer who also has a day job at CBS, uh, co-host of CBS This Morning, uh, former moderator of Face the Nation, and author of the Atlantic Magazine cover story, How the Presidency Became Impossible. And we're going to talk today uh, about the presidency. John, you know more about the presidency than many people, including presidents. <laughs> it's, it's disconcerting how much you know about the presidency. Uh, so let's just jump right into this. The, the idea behind this, this cover story for The Atlantic is, is that the presidency is completely unmanageable. We all know that the presidency is completely unmanageable. The, the question at the moment, of course, is, is this the fault of the current president, uh, which is to say, his idiosyncratic approach to ruling America uh, has brought into sharp relief uh, some of the problems of the presidency? Or is this just, just a sort of a structural problem? Is the presidency, as, as it's practiced now, just an impossible job? Yes. Okay. Jeffrey. Thank Good. you. And that concludes Thank you very our much hour. For joining yes. us. Thank you. That so, was well, we should take people behind the scenes a little bit, which is that this, when we first started talking about this cover a million years ago, on on this, actually not this set, the previous Face right. the Nation set. The, we're on the new Face the Nation set. The old right set. It it was it was not related to this president. I don't believe it was no, so no, no. long ago, right? It so. Was. So it, the idea has been with us for a long time, the question of whether the presidency's gotten too big, whether it's out of shape, whether it's impossible. Um, and so this goes back even to uh, Hoover at one point uh, when, when Ike has one of his, his first heart attack, Hoover essentially suggests that the presidency's too big, there should be a vice president for administration. So that's 1952. Like a prime minister. Right, exactly, which right. leaves the question, what was the other vice president supposed to do since he was pretty, <laughs> since Nixon was feeling like he was underutilized too? But Nevertheless, the question's been with this for a long time, but this president is doing two things. He's highlighting, uh, because he's so idiosyncratic, he is not engaging in lots of the roles of the president. For example, the, the kind of constant attention to um, natural disasters. Puerto Rico would be a good example. He showed up late. He sort of did it perfunctorily. There was the famous image of him shooting uh, paper towels like he was trying to drain three-point shots. Um, Previous presidents would never be able to get away with that kind of approach to a natural disaster. And subsequent to that, the president's not exactly been on the case with, with Puerto Rico, constantly visiting, constantly talking about it. Right. So he has shed some of the roles of the president. Right. Um, and in doing so, it r raises the question, well, should that be a core role of the president? It wasn't always. So are you saying that the Trump presidency is useful in that it, it allows us to examine um, some of the things we expect from a president? Yes. And the question of examining the presidency and whether it's out of shape is necessary to, uh, to analyze any presidency. So whether right. it was the Obama presidency, George W. Bush, President Trump. So one of the things that President Trump bristled at originally on coming into office was the fact that he was so constrained. He said after 100 days that he felt that the job was harder than he expected, which is a common presidential revelation. They all come to this because they campaign as superheroes. I just have to pause you and say, who would think that the presidency is easy? Well, they campaign as if it's easy, and this is the problem. Oh. So when they campaign, they say, well, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and, and they appeal to, and this is, of course, we can talk about this, the extent to which presidents have increasingly amped up the amount of things they say they can do. Then they get in the job and they have those expectations they have to meet. So they can either meet those expectations, which of course is impossible because they are not kings. Uh, and instead of being able to meet those expectations, they have to basically say, oh, it turns out it was harder than I thought. They're willing to make that admission to explain for the, for why they haven't been able to do the 15 things they said they were going to be able to do right away. Right. Let's, let's go back all the way to the beginning. We're going to come back to Donald Trump and the way he carries out the responsibilities or doesn't carry out the responsibilities we associate with the presidency. Let's go back all the way to the beginning, the founders. What did they think the presidency was supposed to be? Well, they were unclear, right? So they wanted it not to be a kingship. They want, so they were very clear about that. But and, then, and George Washington was adamant. Like, like, like the best thing that he ever did was to step down. Yes. So as not to make it a monarchy. Exactly. And he was adamant about everything from the way he behaved to the title he was given. There was no Your Excellency or anything. Um, and, and they wanted to make sure that it was not an office with so much power that they could be, that they could become, a president could become like a king. On the other hand, the real worry from Alexander Hamilton and others was that if you didn't give it enough power, the president wouldn't be able to move quickly enough. Legislators are only elected every two years or six years in the Senate. 
So you need an office that is responsive to the natural, uh, the national moment. Um, you see how I said the na national moment and not the, the public. So this is an, a crucial in the evolution of the presidency when we get into Wilson's age, you start to think of the presidency as a necessary place that is uh, responsive to the public will. And that's right. a big change. But the originally in the founders wanted the president to float above it all. To well, there was no to, campaigning. There was right. no uh, there was no interaction with the public the way they have. Today. To campaign was to be seen as unfit for the office because it meant you were grubbing for votes. It meant you were appealing to people and selling your thoughts to people instead of doing what a president should do, which is use their calm, clear reason, their virtue, uh, and to adjudicate whatever issues were before them. But mostly to leave most of the work to Congress, and and that was the the primary engine of the American government. And the presidency was uh, supposed to act in, of course, in cases of war um, and in moments of execution, but executing, of course, the laws that Congress did first. So, so a bunch of things have happened in the interim between James right. Madison and now. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's happened is, well, well television and the, and, and, the, and the entertainment quality that we've invested in the presidency. But another is that Congress is kind of withered as a co-equal branch. Is that, is that too harsh a statement? No, no, I don't think, I mean, you know, in interviewing all the practitioners from various uh, administrations, when I talked to Dennis McDonough, the chief of staff for Barack Obama, he said, no conversation about, any conversation about the presidency has to start with Congress. And so that's why this piece, while it's about the presidency, because I think as Sid Milkus, who's at the uh, University of Virginia, uh, professor there points out is we sort of think of government through the presidency. I mean, it is for better or for worse, and his argument would be for worse. We think of president as government. So when you're, even though we're talking about the president, we have to talk about Congress. Who's to blame? Well, it's a, so this is a big, let's step back for just one moment to your, to go to your initial question, which is why are we raising this question now? Okay. There are a couple of reasons, and it's been raised, as we say, over the course of the years. What's I think changed we put our finger on a few things. One is the post 9-11 age makes terror threats and the national security picture more complicated. Even more complicated than the Cold War? Because as you know, and we'll, you can, when we, when we speak, speak about this more in depth, in the Cold War you had one enemy, you know? Right. So you had the USSR, Nixon decided to play China off the USSR, but everything fit through the sorting mechanism of capitalism versus communism, roughly. Now you've got non-state actors, you've got, uh, I mean, look at the Middle East alone, your area of expertise, how much complexity and, um, and mess there is in the Middle East. And that's not to say that presidents didn't care about the Middle East during the Cold War, but think of all of the drama that's come right. out of the Middle okay. East. Then there's China. So it's a much more complicated. Okay. And because you can uh, fly planes into buildings or send cyber threats, Right. There, there are more numerous threats than during the Cold so War. So let's go back to this, this, this blame question. When did For it shift Congress. into a, a kind of unwieldy mess? Well, it depends. You can go back to, um, you know, uh, the beginning of the founding of the country when they tried to create a presidency and a government free of faction. They said if the political parties come up, then it will be a disaster because then people will basically behave and think of policy not based on the merits and based on their calm, clear reason, but because they wanted their team to win or the other team to win. And so that started as soon as basically you have the fights between Hamilton and Jefferson. You have this break into parties. Now, that goes away a little bit. Um, uh, the Whigs die off, but, um, and you, go, you bump along for a while. And, and I think the current thing that we try to put our finger on in, in this piece or, um, is the partisanship that comes along I mean, the moment we choose to decide to put it down is the 1990 budget deal where George W. Bush, excuse me, George Herbert Walker Bush puts together a deal with Democrats the budget on a better and more sustainable path. Democrats, Republicans show up in the Rose Garden at the White House in what would look very strange today to have yeah. the leaders of both parties all praising each other, a big kumbaya moment. Well, while that's going on, Newt Gingrich is, has left the White House refusing to sign on to this deal, saying it's a betrayal of conservative principles. He goes back to the Hill where he is greeted as a conquering hero because he By has that, said- By that, that time's version of the Freedom Caucus or whatever. Precisely, yeah, yeah. exactly. So this is 1990. Party, right. That budget deal breaks down because both the wings and the left and the right won't go along with what the president and the leaders of both parties have decided. So that begins or is a part of a process in which the wings, and particularly this is true, more true on the Republican side than on the Democratic side, although in the next uh, presidential campaign we may see more sorting on the, on the Democratic side, but where the wings of the party, the ideologues in the party are more and more influential 
So I don't want to oversimplify this, but are you saying that, that there's two ideas here, George H.W. Bush idea of governance and the Newt Gingrich idea of governance, and we know what happened to Bush. Right. I mean, he, no new taxes, right? I, I mean, you know, and, and, and then he, he violates that promise in the interest, he would say, and a lot of Democrats and Republicans at the time would say, uh, the interest of, of continuity of government and good government, and, and he gets punished for it. Newt Gingrich is rewarded. Exactly. So is all this piece really about Newt Gingrich? Well, a lot of people actually, you, you can, a lot of conversations about what's happened in our uh, national government do kind of get back to Newt Gingrich in a way because A, it was not just that he was keeping the flame for conservative principles. It's that he then uh, initiated, rose to power and made, put into the modern era the sort of, the sort of weaponizing of grassroots upset in, in terms of punishing those, right. the heretics. Um, and he had technology coming on board that would help him. Yes. C-SPAN, the uh, broadcasting of Congress and And, and he so was on. a very patient tactician yeah. and strategist who worked and built a farm team of people who then came and filled the seats of Congress who had his same worldview and his same approach, which meant as a president trying to build coalitions, you had fewer people who were going to work with you. Right. Um, this also became a conduit for grassroots opinion, which had been frustrated with the establishment in the Republican Party before, going back to the 50s. The National Review says it basically created itself in response to the Eisenhower presidency. Right. So here you have a Republicans and a, and a conservative movement that grows up, not because of the evil socialist Democrats, but because of the capitulation as they saw right. it of Republicans. I don't want to pin all the blame or credit on, on Newt Gingrich. Let's step back one, one more moment to the founders. To, to Madison, who believed in indirect democracy, for instance, uh, was it that was it that we was it that they were um, unrealistic about human nature and about and about the system, or is it about that we are debased? I mean, in other words, if Madison were to come back today and look at our system, he'd probably go right back to the 18th century right. here. Uh, but uh, but is it that they had an unreasonable expectation of what humans, a human polity could do? I don't think so. I mean, they, they had... They because did not have the they, internet. They didn't, but they designed it so that, remember the famous line in the, in the Federalist Papers about ambition fighting ambition. So they right. knew that everybody would operate in their own self-interest. And as a result, formed a government with shared power so that everybody operating their self-interest could only go so far. And a lot of the constraints the presidents feel are there by design so that an ambitious president who was off on his own self-interested course would be constrained by the other branches. And one of the things when we talk about the supine role Congress plays now is they not only are no longer a partner with the president, they not only are, are more partisan than, than they used to be, but they also are not checking the president if they are of his same party in the way they used to. And so that independent role of Congress has also atrophied. But um, I think they thought that, that, that lawmakers would be um, uh, pursuing their self-interest. Now, I think what they didn't see, of course, was the way in which you could have influence of the kind we have today from special interests. Um, and that there would be some level of kind of standard that people would try to keep. They would fall short, but they would still, in public, have to keep that standard. And, you know, one of the things we see, uh, just a contemporary standard that has fallen, um, is remember when presidents used to, even if they were behaving in a partisan fashion, they would talk about bipartisanship uh -huh. and they would suggest this was a goal of something that they were doing, would try it, fail, and then they'd go their partisan way. So far in this administration, there has been no effort, really almost at all, on right. any bipartisan. Well, you write about this in the, in the piece that, that Obama came in thinking that he could convince anyone of, of anything. And, and are you saying that Donald Trump is simply more honest in his approach? Or are you saying that he's debasing what should be uh, a more bipartisan, consensual approach to governance? So this is the great question of the Trump presidency. Does he operate in the way the world is the way it is or the world is the way it should be or, or people might want it to be? So what President Trump has essentially done is looked at a system in which um, he's going to go... I mean, he had two choices. He could create coalitions of Democrats and Republicans, which is what he talked about on the campaign trail, right. getting into a room and negotiating with both sides. Or he could just run a, a totally base-oriented, sort of forget even the theatrics of bipartisanship. Don't have the White House meetings. I mean, he's had a couple of public uh, kind of before the cameras talk yeah. about partisanship that, that aren't the, the real deal of governing. And so he's just basically decided to run as a partisan president, which may be the evolution. He looks at the current system and makes the, 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 uh, the con draws the conclusion that Democrats are never going to work with him. So why should I even participate in that charade? Let's just get things done. Right. Now, that's fragile, 
And it means that what happens is you have government that whipsaws from one to the other, right? You have a president who passes some stuff, then the next president undoes it. And all you have is presidents doing and undoing each other and not addressing, of course, the problems of the day. Right, right. I, 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 I'm straining to be linear here, but it's impossible when you're talking about the presidency because no. there's different examples from different eras. Let's go, go back for one minute before we come back to Trump. Go back to FDR. Because I think, I mean, at least as I read you, and at least as I read history, FDR represents a moment when the presidency became, relatively speaking, for the time, a kind of gargantuan project. Yes. Is that yeah. fair? Oh, yeah. Well, and of course, the Times demanded it, first with the Great Depression and then the Second World War. But gargantuan was, uh, by our standards, not very gargantuan. Well, that's right. And one of the things that John Swansburg, who edited this, and I, every time we wanted to bring in history, the point was not to just tell pretty stories or say, like, this is the way it was, and just kind of have it lay there. Though it's filled with pretty stories. Well, it's exactly stories. right. But the, the stories have to be not just, um, you know, they have to highlight and illuminate a specific point we're making about today. So what intrigues me about FDR is, okay, so... FDR has almost no White House staff by the definition of White House staff today. How many people? He had, I think, well, it depends because of the way they, do. the cabinet agencies operated independently of the presidency. I mean, he picked his secretary of state, but they were an independent person. So he had a couple of secretaries. So um, essentially FDR creates a commission, uh, the Brownlow Committee, which looks at the presidency and determines, basically FDR says, look, I can't do this job. Um, with the staff that I have and in the organizational structure that I have. So he creates the Brownlow Committee. They come back and they say, famously, the president needs help. So there's a piece of legislation that goes to the Hill. The president asks for like a handful of staffers, almost really less than a dozen. Congress goes berserk, including members of his own party. People are marching in the street wearing Paul Revere costumes, saying we don't want a dictator because he's asked for this very piddling number of staffers to help him do his job. Literally fewer than 10. Fewer than 10, right. Yeah. And um, so what's extraordinary about this is there is an uprising. I mean, I think 300,000 uh, telegrams are sent to the Amazing. Hill. Amazing. At this power grab by the president, okay? With it, from within his own party. So, Eisenhower, so <laughs> FDR says, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punish those Democrats who uh, voted against my reorganization of the executive branch. So in the election of 1938, he has what's called at the time a purge of the Democratic Party. Says, I'm gonna take on those Democrats. And basically all the Democrats he backs lose, lose. So he tries to take them on and fails again, miserably. A couple of things intrigue me about this. One, FDR expanded the office and even he was supremely constrained by the public and the Congress. Now you have a situation in which Bob Corker, Jeff Flake, and other Republicans who are not in lockstep with the current president have essentially been run out of their party. Right. You just named most of the Republicans who are not in lockstep. Right. I mean, it, was, it doesn't take a long time to do that. And they're no longer in the party. So right. the president can purge without even bothering to have an election. It's a self-purging mechanism now in right. which you have this, this relationship between a president and his party that is completely in sync. And you have a White House, of course, that is now ballooned in size and, and, uh, and in the number of cabinet agencies and everything. One of the contradictions of the presidency is that it is both the most powerful office in the world, but, and you write this in the article, uh, presidents are often astonished by how little they can actually achieve. That's one of the reasons many move toward foreign policy, national right. security policy, because right. they can do things by fiat in a way that they can't do. So, so how, how, do, how do I understand this contradiction? Uh, it's become more and more powerful. Power has been more and more centralized. Symbolic and real power has been centralized in the presidency over the decades. But on the other hand, most people come into the office, including Donald Trump and including Barack Obama, uh, come in and say, wait, I can't do all of the things I actually promised to do because of these built-in constraints. Well, if you look at the, the problems they want to try to solve, immigration, entitlements, um, uh, um, any tax and ec economic policy, um, they have to go through Congress, and Congress is, a, you know, is a mess at the moment in terms of working with the president. They don't have the majority, so they have to do it through reconciliation, which lowers the threshold for what you need to pass. So any of the domestic promises they've made in the campaign, and you tend to make more domestic promises in the campaign than foreign policy promises, because that's, and we should get to the, the campaign yeah. system and the way that's changed the way the presidency works, but any of this, that stuff they want to do on health care, taxes, immigration, all has to be done in this hyper-partisan um, atmosphere in which things are moving slowly. So they move slowly by the design of the founders and they move really slowly because of this hyper-partisanship we've talked about. On foreign affairs, um, they have all of this free room to move. Uh, President Obama and his team would tell you that they sometimes felt a little bit over their skis and you should weigh in here on drone policy. Because yeah. they were like, 
we're just making it up as we go along. Right. There is no Congress stepping in and saying, you well, know, this stop. goes to your point, which is that Congress, there's an abdication. Yeah. You, can't, you, can't, you can't turn this presidency into an imperial presidency without the active abdication uh, for people who don't want to weigh in because they don't want to be held responsible. Right. That's exactly. the that's the thing. No, I mean go keep keep going on this foreign policy issue because I feel as if we're watching right now a a president has decided that he's going to remake the world in part because it seems to go faster yeah. as a process. Right, exactly. And so you see, I mean, whether it's moving the, the embassy to Jerusalem or what the president is doing. Um, well, the Iran deal, in the Iran de Right, the Iran deal, the Paris Climate Accords, the relationship with China, and now North Korea. So this, is a, this reminds me very much what we're talking about right now, I I Nixon. Because Nixon basically thought, look, you could have some administrators deal with domestic policy, but where greatness is achieved and where America can really be either helped or hurt by a president is in foreign policy. And this was the way, this was his mindset surrounding the meeting with Mao and the, and the pivot, and not the pivot to Asia, but the, but the embracing China for the first time since 1949. And um, when you look at Nixon and what, two things are really striking. One is this focus on foreign policy and basically this feeling that it was all in his hands. Like he could do it all himself. There wasn't Congress. I mean, yes, he got some grief. The National Review was boycotting him because they thought he was too weak on, on the communists by, right. by even thinking about embracing um, China. But the other thing that's striking about this compared to um, the President Trump's meeting with the North Korean leader is the amount of preparation that, that went into the Nixon meeting. Nixon prepared for that meeting for basically three years. He'd written a, an article in 1967 for Foreign Policy magazine on his thoughts about Asia. He was a student. There was 500 pages of briefings that Kissinger had had with Zhao Enlai. Um, he had a four-foot-tall set of briefing books before his meeting with China. It was, it was a so belief. It's just like today. Yeah. It was this belief that you really had to understand foreign policy b because it was complicated right. and because you had such free reign. There's an interesting uh, aspect of the of the opening to China that that relates to the media age in which we live. You you know this story is better better than anyone. Um, Henry Kissinger, when he was going to negotiate the 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 the, the, the seemingly spontaneous summit right. uh, visit of Nixon to China, uh, disappeared for a week, and, and he was actually uh, he was actually talking to the Chinese secretly. But there was a story put out that he had the flu or something like that. And and imagine today. A president or his secretary of state or, or someone of equivalent stature just disappearing right. um, and, and not having the internet explode with conspiracy mongering and and the good journalists of the world all hunting down the person to figure out what they're doing. You can't you can't do anything in, in, in secret anymore, and that's a problem for the presidency, right? You can't really negotiate sensitive treaties with adversarial countries. Uh, in the full glare of, of the internet. Right, it's true. Although Pompeo was able to, CIA, then CIA director, now Secretary of State. That is true, he was CIA was able director. to yeah. sneak in, and he was CIA director, so when they go missing, you'd be, you know, you figure yeah, it's part of the yeah. job. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but you're right, and what will be really fascinating is the way in which this is adjudicated. You know, there was a tiny little fibrillation um, in, uh, in mid-May about the so-called Libya model for, for dealing with right. North Korea. And it was adjudicated in the moment, oh my God, is the, are the talks gonna fall apart? As you know, the theater that surrounds these is full of ups and downs and this is and that's and it's, but, but right now, every little time there is a little hiccup, it is covered as if it is the end of the free world. Right. And um, that again is a part of a thing that, uh, the other amazing thing just in terms of press coverage is Nixon leaves for China, on, leaves on the White House lawn, again, First of all, it's treated like he's going to the moon with the number of cameras and the number of people on the White House lawn, but also the leaders of both parties are there to see him off. Um, it is a national moment by the president. Um, you know, be That's very surprising impossible if we to saw that. imagine. Yeah. That's yeah. impossible right now. Come to this subject about, it, this is partially a media question, um, the expectations that we put on the president. You write about uh, visiting hurricane sites and, and being the national mourner in chief. Um, we all seem to agree, I think, that it would be better if the president didn't feel compelled to go to Louisiana when after a hurricane to sort of comfort people and get in the way. Um, it's not his role. He has people to do that. Uh, but if he didn't do that, if the current president or anyone else didn't do that, don't you think that we sure. in the media would punish him well, for that? Well, it's a great, this is one of the great tensions. So 
A president is the only person who can deliver the kind of balm that a visit provides, which is, you're not alone. We're coming to help. Um, it is a symbolic gesture that actually can do some good. It doesn't get in the way, really, of what the, the you know, the, 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 the work that's being done. Oh, on it's the hard to argue that, though, because, I mean, two days after a hurricane, when the presidency moves itself to a hurricane zone, that means that all the officials who should, the local officials who should be cleaning up and doing whatever they need to do, have to pause, greet the president, welcome him, do all of that show. I mean, sure. it does get in the way. Well, it gets in the way, but it's, an, but it's not an acute interruption. Okay. And the upside is you have all, all these people saying the nation is looking and we're, you know, we're here for it. But you. that's what I'm talking about, that expectation. Yeah. Why is the nation waiting for the president to act like the Queen of England? Well, because we have a view of the presidency started by Lyndon Johnson and affirmed by subsequent presidents. Uh, as a as a kind of man on the spot and an action hero uh, who appears at the right moment and the way we cover natural disasters and this is all television's fault is that here was an unfolding national drama that we can splash across TVs and keep people glued to the TVs and what's more compelling than seeing the family plucked out of their, you know, waiting in their living room up to their necks in water, the rescues were dramatic. The, the human interest stories were dramatic. So suddenly you had a national drama playing out. And so everybody's watching this on television and a president sees an opportunity, which is so the president's the, the star of the this president's drama. The president's the star of the drama. And right after Lyndon Johnson goes down to help with Hurricane uh, Betsy in Louisiana, you see the headline in the Washington Post that says the president, you know, initiates action. It is Going back to our previous point about a president who gets in the office and realizes there's not as much control as he wants, it's a chance outside of foreign policy to show he's on the case, that he's making stuff move, that he's unsticking red, you know, unsticking the stuck parts and blowing through the red tape. So it's an opportunity for a president to act. And what Leon Panetta said is one of the ways you manage a president is give them action, give them things, give them to, things do. to do. And so a pre now the question then is, should we all stop expecting this because uh, it, it, it distracts a president, and um, and also we apply this in uh, not in the same way. So, for example, Barack Obama was on the hook and took a political hit for not solving the BP oil spill, which is fast insane enough. when you think about it. When what is he supposed to do about a, a leaky oil well in the Gulf of Mexico? Exactly. And but now here, this is really interesting. So that's exactly right, and that's essentially what President Trump says about Puerto Rico, which is. Look, the infrastructure in Puerto Rico was a mess. That was, you know, there long before I ever came. And then you had this massive natural event over which I have no control. And so, yes, it may be going along slowly, but those are not things for which I should be blamed. Pre President uh, Obama was blamed for BP in just the way you say. Now, here's the thing, though. You go to the Obama people and you say, well, wasn't that unfair to you? And they say, you know... They have what, and this we took this out of the piece because we didn't have the space, but they had this theory basically about the presidential complaint window, which is when you are upset with your national government, you can't go to Bob Cork or Senator of Tennessee. You have to go, there is a central figure who is the repository of national complaints about the way things are going, and that's the president. And he just basically has to suck it up. As LBJ said, sometimes it's like being a jackass in a hailstorm. You just have to sit, sit there and take it. And that's, they believe that that's an important part of the presidential role, which is that he's the one place everybody can go focus their anger and complain on, even if he's not really uh, on the hook for it. This goes to a question about emotional bandwidth, not just intellectual bandwidth that we expect of a president. Uh, it seems as if there's no job in the world that demands more emotionally of its occupant than the presidency of the United States. Can you talk about I, that for a minute? I think it does. And it's another thing that we hit on. If we said post 9-11, security challenges, rise of partisanship, these are two things that have changed in the last, well, since 9-11, that have created the impossibility of the moment that's different than the impossibility in the past. And the psychological squeeze is another one, which is that everything we've talked about, to the extent that the presidency increases, um, that is more weight on the presidential brain. Secondly, if you look at the, the social media and media landscape now, presidents are getting nibbled at in more ways than ever before. That also creates, and Andy Card has a great explanation of what it was Andy like. Andy Card, former it, Bush administration. Former official. Bush administration official also in, so worked for the father, Herbert Walker right. Bush, and for George W., which was his chief of staff. He describes what it was like in the pre kind of frenzied media age where you'd have kind of one story you had to manage during a day and then at about six o'clock you'd have your last little hiccup of, of crisis because of the evening newscast at 6.30 and once that newscast started you could kind of relax for a minute. 
He says, you know, when, when he got in the George W. Bush period, it was two things happened. One, there was just more news everywhere. So it's online. It's, it's not just the evening news. It goes on all the time. So it's a 24-hour news cycle. And the standards had changed. So what in the past was a rumor that somebody would bring to you off the record to try to get you to confirm it, but you knew if you didn't confirm it, it wouldn't show up somewhere. Now you know the rumor gets printed. So now you're reacting to a thing that's been printed. You have to determine whether, what your reaction is going to be or whether you're going to react at all. So the number has increased and the kind of the stakes have increased because things that in the past might never have gotten printed are now getting printed. So that creates for a president's a presidency and a president just more people are nibbling at you. Then if you look at obviously the stakes after 9-11, you can have um, more attacks. They're on the homeland, right? So you had, you had Pearl Harbor and then you had 9-11. But between that period of time, you didn't have to worry about attacks in America uh -huh. of the kind um, that we now have to worry about. That obviously raises the stakes in, just in terms of um, the decisions you make. Also now, because as you know, presidents are making, you know, if you have, as President Obama did, a list of people in your desk drawer that you want to kill, um, and you are making the decision to have that drone fire, right. you're making decisions day to day S to kill people. Stay on that just for a minute. Um, you write very feelingly in the, in the article about, about moments like that. One minute, you're deciding whether to kill someone. Right. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. Your, your, your counterterrorism chief is coming and saying, in the next 30 minutes, so-and-so is going to be in a place where we can kill him. And if you don't kill him, he might kill us. Um, and then the NCAA volleyball championship team comes for a photo op, and you have to go out there and make light banter about volleyball. Yeah. Uh, what do people say about I mean, what, what, what do the shrinks say about this capacity? Well, that, it, I mean, no human has the capacity to toggle that They way. don't. And also, by the way, if you say the wrong thing at the volleyball court, that could be the, the thing you have to respond to for the next 24 hours. Admittedly, it's hard to say the wrong thing at a volleyball well, welcome you know, ceremony. But when you've got an entire structure of partisan media on the other side waiting for you to slip right. up, um, and you can try and blow that off. You can inadvertently off. insult volleyball, well, you and then you got a 24-hour news cycle. <laughs> Um, but what the, what, they, what the psychologists say um, is essentially, if you believe that willpower is a muscle, which most of them do, although there is a little bit of debate about this, yeah. you are constantly having to engage your willpower to restrain yourself right. and to check yourself uh, and to ignore the critics, and there are now more of them, and they're saying things that irritate you uh, more deeply. And you constantly have to keep your restraint on. Well, if it's like a muscle, you know, if you hold on tight to, for something, after a period of time, you're just not going to be able to hold on tight to it anymore. And so you, um, you are unable then to deploy your willpower, focus, and attention to the super important, crucial stuff that can pop up on your day at any moment. Right. So, um, and also another thing happens. Eisenhower, who was one of the great life hacker presidents, who thought about how he did his job and the best ways to do it, assigned himself vacation all the time. It's why he played 902 rounds of golf in his presidency, which today, would, you know, presidents would be... Um, uh, what well, they are criticized. They are. Yeah. So he, was, he basically built vacations into his presidency because he knew the job was so tough right. that he needed to be able to and break this is from. the guy who won World War II. Right, exactly. He, he knew II what pressure and, was. Exactly. And uh, he knew that in order to operate effectively under pressure, you needed to give yourself some, some room. I, I was always in the camp of people who said that let Barack Obama smoke. Yeah. Smoke all he wants. He could get off cigarettes after the presidency. Right. And right. smoke, golf, do whatever you need to do. Because also, by the way, if you are running a presidency in which you need to be there at the tending the moment, every moment, you've got a bad presidency. Right. Let's talk about another problem related to the choosing of a president. Um, and that's what we campaign on or what we expect people to campaign on. They campaign now on grandiose promises. If they came out, if a candidate came out and said, Listen, people of New Hampshire, I want you to know that I've already appointed a team to plan out who I'm going to appoint to run cabinet, uh, in, in cabinet positions. Uh, I'm, I've appointed teams to think about our priorities for the first year. People in New Hampshire would say, and the media would say, oh, aren't you awfully presumptuous? Right. But you make the argument in this, in this article that, that we should judge people, Mitt Romney you used as a perfect example, yeah. judge people on their willingness to plan yeah, because, for their job, assuming they get the job. Well, because when they get into the job, by the time they've gotten the job, they are both not trained for it and don't have the time to get up to speed before they actually have to take the job. So any corporate merger that was of the size and complexity of the, presidential, of the American presidency takes about a year and a half to do. 
and it has teams and teams and teams of lawyers and, and analysts to create the proper governing structure for the new entity that will emerge from the from the merger. Okay, you get two months as a president, and it's all happening under the glare. You're of also madness. exhausted. You're ex yeah, right. You're exhausted. You've just run for president, and you've been trained in the running for president to believe in skills and instincts which all mostly need to be shed once you get into the presidency. What do you mean? Well, so you've been trained to basically attack an opponent and right. basically give a speech, and that's what'll get you through to the next thing. A lot of times in the presidency, there is no opponent, and there's no speech that can be given. If you're focusing on the speech, you're not focusing on getting the job done. Also, when you're a president, it is me or the other person. It's a binary choice that you offer people. When you're trying to sell healthcare le legislation to people, it's a whole complex series of issues you're trying to get them to believe in, not just is it good or is it bad. And one minute you might be debating on uh, uh, some piece of wrong news about pre-existing conditions. The next it might be coverage rates. The next it might be insurance companies. You've got to tend all of those fires. Whereas in a presidential campaign, all you can basically say is my opponent is bad. Any, no matter where you start in the conversation, you can pretty quickly get to my opponent is bad, and that's where you want to be. On a healthcare debate, that's awfully hard to do. So you're... Where do you get that testing skill? That's really hard. You have to basically either learn it on the job or have been a politician who had to deal with that at, at the well, gubernatorial level. There's a great, I think it's Hoover, a great Hoover quote who, who is, and this is stepping back a ways, yeah. already recognizing this, um, says that when you pick a doctor, you want to pick an uncommonly good doctor. When you pick a lawyer, you want an expert lawyer. But when, when we choose the president, we all of a sudden decide that we want a common man. Yeah, exactly. go, go to that. Go to that psychological need, maybe a need created by the press to some degree, but go to that psychological need to have someone who's like us when what you're describing, in fact, is, is a presidency that demands someone who's not like us. Right, well, there's a great um, political science book called The Par Paradoxes of the American Presidency, and there are lots of these. But you want, yes, so Americans want a president who can hang with them so drink a boiler maker in Pennsylvania or go bowling or eat pork rinds, uh, and yet they want somebody who is more like a king, somebody who is so uncommonly spectacular that they can handle all these things and is unruffled and isn't weighed down by any of the human problems of the job that we, we talked about earlier in terms of the psychological strain. And so you have this, but, but in the American system, you have basically, Abe Lincoln is, is the great example, and, and Gautam Makunda at, at Harvard, who's made a science of looking at the way we pick presidents, says, you know, the, the, both the genius and the danger in the American system is somebody with no experience, really, like Lincoln, can arise and be, a, you know, a, perhaps our greatest president. And then somebody with lots of experience can rise into the, can go through into the job and be a terrible president. Who's an example Warren of Harding, that? Warren, Warren Harding. Harding or... or uh, Anybody from the modern era? Uh, well, you could say, I mean, so people would say Jimmy Carter. I mean, he was a, a, a naval engineer, um, he was a governor, and he'd been successful in his campaign, so he seemed pretty well set up for the presidency. I mean, the governor, certainly enough, uh, uh, right. is, a, is a job that would, has a lot of the same challenges the presidency does. Um, some people would say George Herbert Walker Bush, although he's having, there's been quite a reevaluation of his presidency and the standards that he tended and carried on and, and left for the president after him, which we now are very much... Uh, thinking about in terms of the maintenance of the presidency. So Herbert Walker Bush is undergoing some um, reevaluation, but in the time, at the time, if you don't get reelected, it's basically, you know, being a one term president is a, is a lonely club to be right. in. Right. Um, no one will judge you a successful president. And there was nobody, been... nobody more, more, I, well, you could argue, but I mean, nobody was more well qualified for the presidency than George Herbert Walker Bush in terms of the variety of experience That's he true. had and the things he'd seen and spending time in China and But the as CIA. you said before, he fell into there was a kind of a, a, a plate shift. Yeah. Right, right when and, and caused by issues that can be a whole other hour conversation. But but he, he operated in the presidency according to the archaic standards of uh, that one standard was that compromise was a value, was right. a positive value. Right. And and, 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 and also, um, you you know, communication was has since, let's say Kennedy, been overvalued in the presidency, and he was coming after the great communicator. So his kind right. of scattershot syntax was seen as a deficiency for him. Right, the great communicator who said once that he couldn't imagine someone who's not an actor being president 
of right. the United States, and which FDR, is an amazing statement. FDR said basically the same thing to Orson Welles, um, which, is, which is true. You need to be able to inhabit the role in the moment that you need to inhabit it, but you can't then think that the, the all the world's a stage. Um, right. There are tar parts of the presidency that happen where nobody's looking, and that's two ways in building the coalition for the first Gulf War for George Herbert Walker right. Bush and in managing the end of the Soviet, uh, the managing the end of communism. He did lots of work, patient, thoughtful, expert level work based on his previous experience that helped the world order. But it was not like out on the flashy stage, and it was hard to campaign on. And that's a way in which one of the reasons we were, you know, we want to look at the presidency is. Pay attention to the stuff that happens outside of the camera lens and recognize its importance because the overemphasis on the theatricality of the presidency, where now we have a kind of real-time, uh, constant theater with the president, obscures the actual more important parts of the role. Is it useful, I want to come to the current president, is it useful at all that this current president is breaking the presidency in some ways? Yeah, and you can see it both, let's say you're a Trump supporter. You're a Trump supporter and you say, he's blowing through all these stupid rules and getting stuff done. You know, he's making, he's making potentially good trade deals with China, right? China is offering after the president threatened him to maybe start buying more U.S. goods. He's getting some progress going with, with North Korea. Um, you know, he got a tax bill through. He's breaking all, uh, he's getting rid of all these regulations. Now, you're a Trump supporter when you're in that role and you're saying he's not bothering with all the, the criticism. He doesn't care about it. He's getting stuff done for me, and that's really great. He's being a very efficient uh, president for, the, for their team. Now, if you're a Trump critic, of course, you say, yeah, and there's a cost for all of that. There's a cost when you run through a, a, a tax bill uh, that um, with no, even without really even having a conversation with Democrats. A, it's a cost because it's unbalanced and it helps certain kinds of people and doesn't, and doesn't help other kinds of people. It also sets up a kind of government where nobody cares about bipartisanship anymore and you're governing just for your 33%. He casts aside the national role of unity that a president usually plays. Well, there's a huge portion of Afri African Americans, Latinos, and people who are non-white in America who feel the kind of danger from his presidency that President Trump played on with voters who felt a danger from the Obama presidency. Right. And so he is leaving things either unattended or exacerbating problems. This, of course, is the view of the critic who, who looks at him not participating in the, in the norms of the presidency, who says he's doing deep damage that will then pop up in other places uh, as a result of this presidency where he's basically just doing uh, what he wants and not kind of feeling any fealty to a lot of these norms of the office. Could, could you imagine a situation? I, I, let me ask you this as, as a preface to the, to the question. Is Donald Trump the least qualified on paper person to be president in American history? Yes, unless you see the job as one where there are no qualifications for the presidency. And, you know, uh, but, but I think in my view of the presidency, because he's great, Here's, what, here's where I think, yeah, where, where I get to yes, is that he brought to the presidency uh, these negotiating skills he talked about, and he brought to the presidency his, his time in business. He has not run the presidency like a business. He has run it like a personal, um, I mean, the, the, the number of people who've been either fired or resigned is a chaos presidency. I mean, there's just no way around that. That's not the way any successful business in America would run today. And the right. reason that that creates problems is, that, again, it leaves things unattended. It creates a situation which you have leaks constantly, which creates this over drama in the American presidency. Most so presidents, though, to be fair, most recent presidents would have been fired by their board of directors had they been CEOs of major companies. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, you could look at George W. Bush in Iraq. You could look at, at, you could even look at, at Barack Obama not fulfilling his promise to enforce the red line and a, and a, and a board of directors saying, hey, you, you made a promise and you didn't keep to it. I mean, you could, you could go back and look at all sorts of presidential failure and say that they didn't run the White House according to the standards of a multinational corporation. Well, right. Oh, I, um, let's see. Bill Clinton, that for, true? For, Bill Clinton for moral failings. Right. Uh, um, you know, I don't know if he would have survived. A, a, well, a, a, but then you, uh, but, the, but the, the reason the, the analogy with the presidency and business isn't apt, of course, is mm -hmm. that a, president, a CEO has so much more power. The reason a president, <laughs> the reason a CEO is on the hook to their board of directors is they have all the power. Presidents don't have all the power, and, the, and so an their board of directors are essentially the Congress. But one of the problems with the American presidency is we don't allow for a mistake making. So that there's so much time spent saying nothing, nothing's gone wrong here, everything's fine. There's none of the adaptive learning that is 
um, central to success in modern business. So you have a you have a lot of nerd fantasies related to the presidency. <laughs> um, one of the nerd fantasies is that is that a president would level with the American people, um, which is to say, I mean, and I, I've thought this too. Imagine imagine at the State of the Union, a president gets up there and says, "The State of the Union isn't that strong." Yeah. In fact, right. Congress, I'm here to tell you, we're not doing so well right now. Uh, and here are the following reasons why. And here's what I think I can do. And here's what you should do. And, and maybe we'll get through it. Um, it would be great and honest if somebody would say that, especially when it's true. But it's an impossible talk about an impossible presidency. Right. That would be the closest we've come to that is Jimmy Carter uh, telling uh, the famous malaise speech. Right. Right. And um you have to, that's why you have to set the expectations for the presidency outside of the individual presidents. And we have to think about, it's why some of the people who've reacted to this are focused entirely on President Trump. My view is the only way to evaluate him is to understand the presidency as it exists right now. And then you can decide whether his failings are his alone or whether they are the failings of the presidency uh, the way it currently exists, where you don't have a really a partner in Congress. Um, right. where you are overloaded by all kinds of duties that aren't actually central to what you should be facing as your central core. Um, but then, outside of that, we need to think about the presidency so that um, we have better expectations for the job and when we pick these people, because in the moment, you're, you're, uh, people don't think about the, the, anything other than what's happening in that moment. And that's right. more the case now. Right. Um, talk about a little bit about the reaction. I have a lot of reaction to this article. It's been out for a little while now. Um, one of the interesting things that I've seen is people saying, uh, you're making, uh, this is some critics, I think many of whom haven't actually read the right. article, another sign of our age, right? right. Um, right. Uh, who have said, uh, oh, you're just making an excuse for Donald Trump. The presidency was fine when X person was president right. or Y person was president, and Donald Trump has has ruined everything, and you're covering for that. Right. I mean, you, you've seen some of that. What's sure. your response to that? Well, the one is, as you say, it's um, here's the funny thing about social media right now. So, if I were to say to you, you know, I don't like Duck Dynasty because I don't like dramas about waterfowl, you would say you are a ridiculous person. That's not what that is. If I were to say I don't like The Iceman Cometh because I don't believe in refrigerator repair, you mm -hmm. would say you are a ridiculous person. You're Yet not on, an expert, yes. On the, in social media, you are allowed to say, this piece is wrong because of the headline. So no, there's no penalty for not having engaged with the ideas of the piece. So most of the people who felt that way didn't engage with the ideas with the piece. If you do read the piece, you can come away with two conclusions. You can do, if, uh, because it, de it describes all the complexities of the presidency and then the ways that various presidents and experts who've thought about the presidency think it should be run to manage this moment of complexity in life. So the idea is it, it, there is only one president and there is going to only be one president. So there is, given the complexity and how hard the job is, there is a certain set of systems you're supposed to set up and a way you're supposed to run it and ways we could improve it. So looking at the presidency that way, uh, if you are, a, if you are uh, not a supporter of the president, you would say, gee, the presidency is like brain surgery, so we need a brain surgeon. We right. can't just pick someone. And just quickly to interject, um, uh, uh, Michael Levitt, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, was governor of Utah, um, argues that business people, one of the challenges to having a business person in the White House is that they actually are not... When you've been successful in business, you have a set of patterns and approaches that work in your business. And you don't change your mind a lot because those patterns have worked really well. Look at Rex Tillerson at the State Department. Precisely right. So when you get to the presidency, you have to engage a talent that you're not trained for as a business executive, which is throwing away all the things you know. There's a great book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, but that's what you need in the presidency. And it's why Donald Trump as a business executive and this notion that a business executive would improve the job has always been misguided. But then back to the back to this idea of the presidency as brain surgery, some people can look at the complexities of the job and say, I don't agree. I think a person can basically just blow off these parts of the job and be focused on his core ideas. Because of all the complexity, don't manage complexity. Basically do the things you can do. Focus on trade, cutting regulations, and keeping America safe. Let all the other stuff go by the wayside, take the hit, but you're focusing on doing the things that you actually have control over in the current system in the way it is now, and that would be the best argument for what President Trump has been able to do if, at the end of history, we decide that the regulations that were removed did in increase economic 
um, activity in a way that ha broadly helped America. Because one of the unattended problems in America right now is the inequality that is not, is not being addressed unless economic, this is the theory of the Trump administration, economic activity is so robust that suddenly broad prosperity does start happening. If right. that it doesn't happen, then he will have missed a signature challenge of the time. Um, so it's going to take a long time to figure out this current presidency. Um, but I think that you have to, the, the back to the original question about the criticisms, um, I found that the people who did read it, um, there was obviously a lot of uh, favorable response, but then people said, well, yes, but this, or that'll never happen, uh -huh. or there are plenty of places you can tweak and, and, right. de and debate the argument, and that I felt was really... Uh, I, I want to come in one in a minute to what you think should happen if there's some way of fixing this very messy situation. Um, but I want to I, I, I want to talk about a person for a minute who ran unsuccessfully twice for the president, who has some qualities now that we, we believe a president should have as a, as a national unifier. And that person is John McCain, Senator John McCain. Uh, I, I come to the subject of McCain um, through the prism of this, of this question of whether a president ought to try to be the unifier of the country. Until Donald Trump, we have experienced presidents who at least pay lip service to the idea that one, once you're elected, even if it's uh, by 47% by or 51% or however it splits, um, elected by the American people, you're the president of all the people. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump is the first president who really doesn't pay even lip service to that, to that notion. Thinking about John McCain, obviously, because there's a, there's a person with a sufficiently heroic backstory and a, and a record of service that um, that he plausibly is one of those figures who could unite people uh, around a common cause. He didn't obviously win the presidency, so there's that. But the question is, do we make people in America anymore who could inhabit the presidency and truly unify at least, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of the American people around a common cause? Well, I think you, the crop of people who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq are probably going to show us some amazing leaders, people who've been tested in battle, people who come from outside of Washington, which is where we rightly should look for our leaders at the moment, um, and, so, and then who can rely on their heroism and in sacrifice to their country, which is really at the center. You go back to the founders. That's at the center of it, is your character and its relationship to the country. Well, their character was shown in battle on, for the, for, you know, in the service of their country. So that starts them out in a really good place as a president because they can speak with authority in a way that it's very hard for just the chattering class to criticize. Now, the question is, how much is that a part of the presidency? How much is that really? So John McCain, who has that moral grounding um, and who, um, kind of has a, a fingertip feel that, that would have um, probably guided his presidency to kind of, um, you know, he was receptive to the notion of the national kind of psyche that needed I, to I be I guess that's what I mean to. about him, is that there's a man who seems to inhabit or who seems to seek the center and seek unity rather right. than discord. And he ran his presidential campaign in 2000 on the idea of, on two big ideas. One was campaign finance and the idea that the, the forgotten class that Donald Trump talks about was being forgotten because basically the lobbyists had their hooks into any piece of legislation and they were thinking about their, their clients and not regular people. That was one thing. But then the other was he talked constantly about trying to inspire a next generation of people to be inspired in a cause greater than their self-interest. The idea that there was a national call to sacrifice and service that a president could bring everybody to. Who knows if that would have happened? Who knows if he could have pulled that off? But that's a fascinating idea because right now we see the country cleaving and right. we see the president engaged in, um, in you know, helping that cleavage take place. One of the things, right, though, that's about, the unusual thing at the moment. That's very that, unusual. That, that, that the president is is trying to widen the uh, the, the, the chasm, not 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 bridge it, and even the, even rhetorically. And what is the you know, because obviously Lincoln widened the chasm, but the difference is what is the chasm widening or bringing together in the service of? Are there values undergirding whatever action you're taking that are a part of those values that the the founders put in the system. If it's if you're doing it just for yourself and to maintain your political viability so your team can win, then you're not keeping faith, faith with what the founders created. And the reason the founders are so interesting is, you know, a lot of times when you look back, you think, well, that was, you know, the, in the horse and buggy era, things were different. 
but they embedded in the system a set of values that can still exist today and that everybody has to try and keep faith with today. That was the thing. It was the, the structures they set up were pretty darn good too. But even if the structures change and the presidency changes, those values still need to be protected. And that's what McCain would have cared about. Now, McCain is a manager, I'm not so sure he would have been great as a president. McCain right. is a policy, um, having deep interest in policy, and he is also he was also and uh, as a as a, um, a senator quite uh, impulsive, and he would he would tell you that himself today. Right. Um, and so, how would that have manifested itself in the presidency? Um, so he would have had a lot of challenges. And by the way, also the boring stuff of the presidency that takes place not in the limelight, mm -hmm. how would he have been in, in working through all of that? The final point is he would have believed a lot in Congress right. and therefore would have um, probably made a lot of effort in the right. in kind of the congressional realm of the job in a way that this current president had. Um, let's finally go to fixes. Um, to the extent that you want to be prescriptive, uh, it sounds as if you're it sounds as if you're describing a set of really impossible challenges. Um, uh, we've moved so far from the original conception of what the presidency uh, should have been. That, that and, and maybe those conceptions were wrong. They were 18th century conceptions, uh, early 19th century conceptions of what a president should be, and they just simply don't work in, in, the, in the current moment. But uh, what would you do if you were king? If you were king, you might appoint someone a king to handle all the, 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 the symbolic uh, parts of, uh, of the presidency. But if you, if you were king for the day, uh, how would you fix the presidency? And I think as important, fix the expectations yeah. well, the of expect the presidency. The expectations are where you have to fix it. So that is, and, and that goes to the campaigns. I would fix the expectations we have for presidents, people understanding the complexity of the job, that it's complex. Um, and the constraints presidents feel because of the complexity built into the job, the constraints built into the job by the founders, and then the additional ones we've highlighted here, which are new, um, just kind of understand that in the presidency. And that's a way to evaluate the current president, but also when we pick our next ones. And that means when you talk uh, about presidential attributes in a campaign, you should do that. You should, in fact, talk about the attributes right. of the job. Then I think that includes talking about how they would run as president. Now, you're never going to be able to squeeze serendipity out of life. So it's not like there's a test you can give somebody that tells you whether they're going to be a good president. Right. But engaging in this kind of conversation, do you know how to manage a team? What was the biggest risk you took politically and how did it pay off? Getting some sense of them engages the nation in a dialogue about these, these things, which then presents, gets everybody ready for what governing is going to be like. And it sort of it begins this expectations changing during the campaign. It also, presumably if you're talking about attributes of the job, it's fewer hours that you can make insane promises about things you're going to do because those promises tend to, they, they shape your presidency. And so we want fewer of those insane promises. We want candidates to, be, to feel embarrassment when they, when they say, I'm going to change it all tomorrow. Uh, when President Trump said, I alone can fix it, people should snicker, uh, not at him, but at the idea that any president can alone fix it. Um, so changing those expectations. And then the other thing that I don't know how you change is the partisanship, because um, a president has to engage with Congress. But we saw on the, on the farm bill in May of, uh, of this year where basically they were unable to get what used to be a bipartisan bill through Congress, in part because the conservative Freedom Caucus um, outmaneuvered Speaker Paul Ryan. Now, this may have to do with Ryan's uh, retiring and all of that, but this is a bill that pretty much used to be able to get through on a bipartisan agreement between the left and the right, and the business of the government could be done. Until that partisanship is, is at least diminished, uh -huh. um, until people are not rewarded by their partisan uh, broadcast channels um, for their heroic actions in green rooms <laughs> um, and, are, and are rewarded for heroic action made in the service of compromise, then then you're not, then presidents are going to continue to be hamstrung. I'm not sure how you fix that. John Dickerson, I, I think we should have Face the Atlantic every week. Every that's what, week? That's what I think we should do. You and me chatting, uh, away. <laughs> chatting about the Just presidency. Keep talking about this yeah. cover. <laughs> this is the uh, Atlantic uh, May 2018 issue, the uh, How the Presidency Became Impossible by John Dickerson. John, thanks very much for doing this. Thanks, Jeffrey, this for great. assigning it and for doing this. Thanks.